Hello and welcome to this educational video. Brought to you by the Society of Mechanical Ventilation. Basics of Mechanical Ventilation. Part 2. Positive and Expiratory Pressure. So, the objectives for this lecture is to define what is PEEP, the advantage and disadvantages of PEEP, and most importantly, the methods used for setting PEEP. Perhaps PEEP is the most studied aspect of mechanical ventilation since its uh, inception back in 1968. If you search PubMed, you'll find almost more than 30,000 articles about PEEP and Google Scholar almost 300,000 articles. And after almost 50 years of research, there's still so much unknown uh, on the benefits of PEEP um, and no much agreement on how do we set PEEP. So what is PEEP and what is the best PEEP? PEEP is the positive pressure airway pressure remaining at alveoli at the end of exhalation. So if you look at this slide here, you have PEEP of 15 and the outside of the alveoli, the pleural pressure is 10. So the alveoli is open at the end of exhalation. It's stable alveoli. Versus on that example on the right here, the PEEP is 5 and with 10 centimeter pressure from outside, so that alveoli will close at the end uh, of exhalation and reopen again at the end of inhalation. And you don't want that to happen, uh, recurrent opening and closing, because that causes ventilator-induced lung injury. So what's our objectives when we set the PEEP? Of course, we want to achieve best compliance, best oxygenation, best functional residual capacity, like the air left uh, at the end of exhalation, a PEEP level that doesn't affect your hemodynamics uh, negatively. A PEEP level that prevents the ventilator-induced lung injury, um, like volutrauma, barotrauma, or atelectasis trauma, as an example. We need a PEEP that reduces ventilator length of stay and improves mortality. So, is it possible to get one level of PEEP that's called best PEEP? Um, in my opinion, it's probably impossible to do that. Uh, one of the reasons is our lungs, even the normal lungs, is very heterogeneous. Especially in ARDS, uh, our lungs has multiple zones with different respiratory mechanics. Uh, so one peak might be good for one zone, but might be injurious to another zone. So if you look at this CT scan here, um, this patient with ARDS, and if you can notice on the top, there's good air, like here. Uh, the middle one is a little bit okay air here, but the bottom zone is usually very consolidated with very low ventilation. So with one level of PEEP, you might find that the alveoli in the top here are very inflated, maybe hyperinflated, compressing on the um, uh, capillaries, so causing very high ventilation perfusion ratio and maybe causing volume trauma. If you look at the bottom here, the alveoli are usually smaller, with uh, consolidated like here, um, but the perfusion is usually good with the effect of gravity. So the middle part here with like okay perfusion and uh, okay ventilation, usually that's where the peak plays. One of the other problems is not all of our lungs are, uh, especially in ARDS, are peak responders. Some uh, some are and some are not. And whatever method we're using um, of uh, calculating respiratory mechanics or applying PEEP, it basically approximates all the lung zones. So in reality, if you want to do good PEEP, you might need uh, uh, endotracheal tube or an airway in each lung uh, zone or in each lobe and we set different PEEPs, but you're probably going to need at least six uh, ventilators, which is impossible. Um, one of the other problems also is that our respiratory mechanics change uh, very frequently, sometimes even in the same breath. So the PEEP that you measured and you applied five minutes ago uh, might not be the best PEEP right now for the patient. Um, one of the other problems too is that the heart-lung interaction is really very complex, uh, especially with the positive pressure and not very well understood.
So let's talk about some myth about PEEP. Uh, I hear that sometimes um, um, physiologic PEEP. Uh, and people say we'll apply PEEP to match the physiologic PEEP. And of course, there's nothing called physiologic PEEP in a normal, uh, healthy person. Uh, otherwise, uh, it will be called auto PEEP, uh, basically an obstructive lung disease. Um, so sometimes I also hear, um, let's apply PEEP to recruit the lung. And remember, recruitment of the lung is an inspiratory phenomenon. PEEP is only uh, expiratory phenomenon at the end of expiration. So you cannot recruit with the PEEP, uh, but PEEP prevents derecruitment of the alveoli. Sometimes I hear it uh, from our friends, cardiologists, that PEEP is dangerous for heart failure. Um, and I would say that actually PEEP is probably the best treatment for heart failure uh, because you can achieve decrease preload, decrease afterload, and even improves contractility, which you can't get with even uh, one medication uh, in treatment of heart failure. So the advantages of PEEP, as we talked before, um, if applied correctly, you would have uh, improved respiratory compliance, improved oxygenation, mortality, and that's a question mark, um, because the literature is not very clear about that or contradictory sometimes. Uh, if again you apply uh, good PEEP, you might prevent ventilator induced lung injury. Although, as we mentioned in the previous slide, I think whatever level of PEEP you're applying, you might cause lung injury in one zone, um, and uh, in, uh, it would be good in another zone. Again, if applied correctly, you might improve the work of breathing of the patient. So the question is, does PEEP have mortality benefit? Um, and this is again very controversial, with uh, some cells saying yes, some no. Some meta-analysis, famous ones, uh, didn't show any mortality benefits. Some later on did. A uh, problem with uh, the studies of PEEP and ARDS are Every different uh, cause of ARDS is not the same. So pulmonary versus extrapulmonary um, do not behave the same. And most of the studies just grouped uh, people with ARDS. Early ARDS in the first usually 48, 72 hours might be different from uh, later ARDS after 48, 72 hours where fibrosis set in. Uh, some of the studies that uh, picked the high PEEP level of around 12 and 13 and in my opinion, uh, this is not really high PEEP. Um, the bottom line is a PEEP has to be custom made for the patient, not one hat fits all. Disadvantages of PEEP, um, hemodynamic effects, as we talked before, and ventilator induced lung injury, uh, like hyperinflation in parts, especially the top parts, and recurrent opening and closing, and usually in the bottom parts, as uh, called uh, arterial catatrauma. So how do we set PEEP, and what's the best method of setting PEEP? Um, we'll talk a little bit about um, different ways, like the PEEP FIO2 table, um, the famous ARDS network protocol, pressure volume curves, stress index, incremental and decremental PEEP, esophageal balloon manometry, electrical impedance tomography, um, functional residual capacity, dead space and VCO2, or ultrasound and CT scans. Um, there is no evidence that one method is better than the others, and maybe I would be biased towards some more than the others. So the first method is, again, everybody knows that the PPFIO2 table of the ARDS network. Um, it's very easy to be done, um, doesn't need any special equipment or special skills, um, depends on the FIO2. Uh, so if you look at that lower PEEP um, FIO2 table, it goes from 30, 40, 50, and depending what level of FIO2 you apply the PEEP, and they have uh, a higher peak table, um, as you can see, can go up to 24. My problem with this method is, uh, despite being very easy, it's very non-physiologic. 
um, not all the lungs are the same and not if we two patients both are in 70% FI2 doesn't mean that both will benefit uh, from peak of 16 um, and again if you look at that uh, low uh, the higher peak table um, if you're in peak of uh, FI2 of 30% you can go from peak of 5 to peak of 14 um, so I usually don't use that, but again, that's my bias towards this method. In this slide, we'll, we'll talk about the pressure volume curve, and I'm going to use an uh, online simulator uh, just to show the curve. Uh, of course, every ventilator has this maneuver and has to be done in a certain different way, so you have to know your own ventilator and how to do this maneuver. In this case, we have a patient here who's uh, in, uh, on the pressure controlled mode and we'll start the maneuver. And as you can see, the maneuver is in progress and it will start inflating very slowly that's the inspiratory limb of course you can make the speed uh, or the flow uh, usually very low flow is recommended uh, of course the patient has to be having no spontaneous effort so usually chemically paralyzed you can put a pause as a recruitment maneuver in the end, but we're not doing this. The yellow line is the expiratory curve. So let's see uh, the low inflection points and the high inflection points that we talked about in the last lecture. As you can see here, we're starting pressure of one. I'm going up pressure of two. You can see the volume is very low, so the lung is closed during inspiration. And at that point, uh, it looks like at peak of 6.5, the lung starts to open and goes a uh, linear phase. So this is called the low inflection point. And as you go up, all this again is a linear compliance, so good compliance. And if you notice here, the curve start uh, to flatten out, becomes a beak shaped. So it means uh, we over inflated the lungs and that's like at the volume of around 1100. So of course you don't want your pressure or volume to be above this point. It has to be under this point and we need to ventilate the lungs on this area. Now if we start going down on the um, expiratory limb, the yellow limb, again you can see uh, we're at pressure of 30. I'm sorry, pressure of 17 and the, the volumes uh, as you can see 1130 we're going down and you can see starting from here the volume start to drop drop linearly too and that's a point called a uh, point of maximum curvature so there's discrepancy in the literature between where do you put the peep is it above the lower inflection point or above the uh, point of maximum curvature or between the area of the maximum hysteresis here now let's see uh, a patient with a poor compliance how the curve will will differ so we'll start the maneuver again with the same settings for now and again we're going very slow we started from pressure of zero and we're going to and I didn't put any pause at the end of uh, inspiration. I'm going to only pressure of 30, but of course you can go up higher if you want to recruit and maneuver and you can put a pause. And we will, during exhalation, we'll go back to zero of pressure. So if you notice this curve, it looks a little bit different. Let's go up again on the inspiratory limb. And I'm going up. The last one was about 6.4. I can see the expiratory, the low inflection point, the curve start to flatten here, become linear at around pressure of 9. 
And if you notice again, that beak part, now because the compliance is low, this patient has ARDS, around 250, you're going to start worsening compliance again. So you want again to put the pressure in that, ventilate that person from this point to this point. And when we go to the expiratory curve, the yellow one, again we'll notice at this point the lungs start to deflate and that's uh, the point of maximum curvature and if you can notice the hysteresis between the inspiratory and the expiratory limb will be very different. And just to show you a difference uh, in uh, another example of a COPD uh, lung, we'll do the same curve for the third time. Okay, uh, you can notice now the peep here, the lungs start to open at like around 5, and you can notice the volume, the tidal volume, we are up to here at seven, almost 1600 or 1700, um, and the expiratory part, the point of maximum curvature is here. So in all these examples, the point is, if you put your PEEP so low, like at 2 or 3 or 4, as like in cases of ARDS, that lung will close at the end of exhalation, and you have to reopen it next breath, and that opening and reclosing, um, it causes atelectotrauma. Another way of... Um adjusting the PEEP is something called the stress index and uh, it's pretty complicated uh, calculation here if you look at it um, which is really hard to calculate um, but sometimes could be done by just visual inspection of the pressure time curve uh, to be noted this has to be done again in a passive patient um, no effort it has to be done on the volume controlled mode with the constant flow or the square wave flow. And we look at, at the curve of the pressure time curve. So if you look here, there is this con, uh, convex shape um, and that uh, correlates with the stress index less than one. And that what that means is there is a continuous recruitment of the alveoli during the breath, which means that the previous peep was not enough you want the stress index to be about one which is a straight line on the pressure time curve and if you see a concavity like this that's a stress index more than one meaning that there was some hyperinflation of the alveoli um, because of too much peep so if you look at the example on the right that's a person on a peep of eight and you can see that convexity up here and stress index calculated at 0.75 and when that PEEP was adjusted to 18, stress index was about 0.97, and you can see it's almost a linear straight line. On the other hand, that person here was a PEEP of 10, and stress index was 1.38, and when the PEEP was adjusted to 0, stress index became almost 1, and it's a straight line here. Again, this has to be done on the volume controlled mode with the square or constant flow wave. We'll talk here about um, the incremental versus decremental PEEP. Um, this is simulator again in a patient uh, with ARDS um, on the pressure control mode. Uh, right now driving pressure of 20, PEEP of 6. Uh, and what incremental PEEP is basically go up on the PEEP step by step uh, till you find uh, the best uh, respiratory compliance. Uh, 
this is usually not recommended uh, as we said before peep does not recruit the lung but rather de uh, prevent the recruitment but simply you go in step fashion I'm gonna try to do it a little bit faster for the sake of time um, until you find the best compliance the other way which is probably better um, is to do a de decremental peep meaning first you do a recruitment maneuver to open the long up and you go up on a high peep and in this example I would start at peep of 30 um, and we'll see what happens with the tidal volume and basically calculate the compliance um, so at peep of 30 and we're gonna start coming down slowly again usually in increments of one and give it a minute or two but again we don't have time to do this at this moment so we'll go by by five so at 30 we're having tidal volume of 351 will go down to peep of uh, 25 and you should notice that the tidal volume should start increase when you're decreasing the peep and that's probably because we're over distending some of the alveoli so the compliance basically improved and if you want to calculate the compliance in this example i know we're in pressure control so the it will be a tidal volume 480 the plateau is pretty much um, here the 46 over 25 so 480 almost divided by 21 it's about 24 milliliter per centimeter water okay let's go down more on the peep so again if we didn't reach the better peep the best peep uh, the tidal volume should again start to to increase again because we're still probably over distending the peep we'll keep going down on the peep and once we are down once the tidal volume start to drop it means we start to uh, close or de-recruit some of our alveoli so the optimum peep will be above that point so let's see we're getting 528 on peep of 20 we'll go to 15 Okay, tidal volume um, is about the same so we probably didn't change much so let's go down <coughs> to 12 okay our tidal volume still haven't changed much oh it actually start to to drop a little bit Yes, so that means now that some of our alveoli have actually start uh, to close breast to breast so peep of 12 is not enough so our best peep was probably to 15 then we'll go back to that peep again now we'll talk about uh, the benefits of the osophageal balloon a manometry to calculate the transpulmonary pressure both inspiratory and expiratory and it's one of my favorite uh, probably ways of setting peep um, and probably we're going to do another video specific for this at some point so again our sim patient here with the ARDS um, I, you, as you can see he's not doing too good his oxygen saturation 65 um, and tidal is very high but so this the first uh, row here is the airway pressure in centimeter water second one is the flow inspiratory flow expiratory flow descending of course you can see that this is a very restrictive long as expiratory flow closing so fast and this is the esophageal balloon which basically uh, try to approximate the plural pressure the effect of plural pressure and the last one is the transpulmonary pressure which is basically a graphic uh, of the airway pressure minus the oesophageal pressure so the oesophageal pressure gives us a whole idea about both sides of the coin 
what's inside the alveoli usually the plateau pressure and what's outside that's the forces opposing the alveoli from the outside which is the pleural pressure estimated by the esophageal pressure and gives us an, um, a transpulmonary pressure so if you notice here um, the inspiratory transpulmonary pressure we can put a pause here um, is about 15 which is okay usually the goal is to keep the inspiratory transpulmonary pressure be below 20 or 25 but the uh, end expiratory pressure in this example is minus 13.4 the reason why because we put the peep is very low so look what happens when we increase the peep so let's start increase the peep the goal is also to keep um, the end uh, expiratory transpulmonary pressure usually above zero and some studies show that this improved the respiratory compliance and oxygenation with some trend towards improved mortality although some other studies also um, didn't show the same benefits so we'll go ahead and put an end expiratory pause And here we're calculating our end expiratory transpulmonary pressure at 3.7. Um, so that's a perfect peep. You can make it a little bit um, below that. But again, the goal is to keep the end inspiratory transpulmonary pressure, which is the plateau pressure minus esophageal pressure, below 25. So in this example, it's actually little bit higher because we're in a high uh, driving pressure and the end expiratory transpulmonary pressure above zero another way of adjusting the peep or setting the peep is through measuring the dead space and the vco2 uh, which is basically the carbon dioxide output and refers uh, to the amount of carbon dioxide exhaled from the body per unit of time usually in normal persons about 200 milliliter per minute so again to the same patient of ours um, airway pressure flow tidal volume and here's the capnography volumetric capnography um, which is actually underused in mechanical ventilation um, so we'll look at the graphics i put that patient on 30 of peep intentionally to over distend him and you can look at the numbers here um, the dead space percentage is about 36 percent so that and where do we get that is um, tidal volume per breath and that's uh, um, dead space volume so the alveolar volume is 248 and the percentage of the dead space to tidal volume is 36 percent uh, usually in normal uh, it's 25 to 30 percent so we're gonna start going down again uh, on the peep decrementally and usually in, in slower way and we should see that um, when we come down on the peep the vco2 um, should increase a little bit if we're over distending and that's because we're worsening the dead space and worsening perfusion uh, or the ventilation perfusion mismatch so as you see when we went down the vc2 improved um, the dead space uh, percentage went down to 24 alveolar tidal volume went up so we'll keep down keep going down like we did in the decremental peep and once we start seeing that uh, the vco2 is going down again again me or the dead space has worsened we should go back up um, to that peep level so we're down to 15 now um, again the alveolar tidal volume 540 the dead space percent 
1,142 over 691 equals uh, 20%. Uh, you can see the VCO2 is dropping a little bit, start to drop. Again, it takes a couple of minutes, of course. So you can see when we went down, um, start to drop. So let's go down a little bit more and see the effect on the dead space and the VCO2. Okay, so so far the alveolar tidal volume has been stable and the VCO2 has changed a little bit but not too significant. And now when we're going down to 10 of PEEP, you can definitely see the VCO2 is going down. The alveolar tidal volume slowly is dropping. And that will probably worsen the dead space. So 10 is not an optimum PEEP. Probably at 12 to 15 was um, the best one. Now moving on to uh, another method called electrical impedance tomography or EIT and this is actually a fascinating technology and it's not new it's been actually being developed over the last 30 years at least uh, but it's just making its way to um, current ventilators uh, these days. Uh, the idea is to put electrodes on the chest and it gives you a visualization of the long uh, ventilation zones uh, in real time, breast to breast, which is a great way to know which area you're hyperinflating and which area you're collapsing. So if you look at this example, this is a patient with ARDS, that's his CT scan. And the electrical impedance tomography in the same plane it gives you visual index if it's like that light blue color that's meaning over ventilation and the dark blue is uh, distension uh, sorry uh, collapse so after giving a recruitment maneuver here they started at 23 and you can see uh, some areas of over um, inflation and keep decremental peep coming down 21 some uh, collapse started again the more you go down the inflation hyperinflation gets less and the uh, collapse or long zone collapse start to get more as you see here down to people five most of the areas of the long was uh, low perfusion so they plotted in another graph here where when you're going down the peep the over inflation goes down and then the collapse start so at that point here it looked like that was be the best peep which looked at about peep of 17 in this example i think this is going to be very important and will revolutionize um, mechanical ventilation setting peep um, and hopefully in the next uh, decade or so we'll know more about this technology and we're going to be using it more Another method we'll talk about is measuring the functional residual capacity or the FRC or uh, the end expiratory lung volumes during mechanical ventilation. And of course, we all uh, know that uh, functional residual capacity could be measured by spirometry um, at the lab um, for the PFTs. Uh, but nowadays, it can be measured during mechanical ventilation and might be very helpful. It's not available uh, on all uh, ventilators. Uh, but in this example, in this graph, uh, it gives you um, through um, a technique called nitrogen washout. And you can do it as a recurring, a recur a recurring uh, maneuver or once every, uh, whenever you want to do it. And it gives you uh, a measure here of the functional residual capacity at different peeps. And in that table here, you see it gives you functional residual capacity at what level of peep and the static compliance of the respiratory system. So you can make the decision based on what's the best FRC and what's the best compliance at the same time. And that's a peep that you should go with. 
of course if the frc uh, in, went up increased but the compliance went down it means that you over distended the alveoli versus if both went down it means that you're uh, collapsing uh, the alveoli and if both went up it means that you're recruiting the alveoli um, again uh, it's not on every ventilator uh, but might be very beneficial technique too Another way is using uh, computerized tomography scans or CT scans uh, to assess the long recruitability during PEEP and setting the PEEP. Of course, the problem is um, it's hard to get a CT scan in the ICU or get the patient from the ICU to the CT scan and keep repeating the maneuvers or repeating the images while you're doing the CT scans, uh, plus uh, the exposure to radiation. So it's not really uh, used much in clinical practice, but the same idea as electrical impedance tomography, um, it gives you an idea, you see what's inside the lung. So for this example here, collapsed uh, basal areas, then after recruiting maneuver, maneuver and high peep, you can see that the lung opened up, although you can definitely see that you're hyperinflating the top parts here and you titrate the peep down until you see more collapse. In this example, there is some improvement definitely in the basal parts and um, you titrate the peep down until again you get the, um, the least uh, consolidations. And in that uh, right side, this is patient who is not even um, uh, peep responsive. Uh, so as you can see here, that was the after recruitment maneuver, we hyperinflated this. The consolidations still look pretty bad in the, base, uh, the basal areas and with titrating the peeps still uh, collapsed areas. So again, uh, very hard to do in clinical practice, mostly in, uh, in studies and research. Recently, there's been a lot of interest in uh, long ultrasound in clinical practice and ICU, and it makes sense because um, it's very cheap, uh, it's reproducible, it's um, no uh, radiation um, exposure, and you can repeat it over and over. The problem is it needs some uh, expertise in interpreting the ultrasound or acquiring good um, ultrasound images during the procedure. Um, so there is a lot of studies about using ultrasound in recruitment and evaluation of recruitment and uh, checking, um, adjusting the PEEP. Uh, for that example, this is a rabbit lung and a PEEP with ARDS and PEEP of 5 and you can see consolidations. The PEEP is being increased here, 7, 9, you still can see the consolidations. And at around 11 here, <clears throat> you can start seeing some A line and B lines, the comet tails, uh, as you can see it here, B lines, some A lines, which means that the lung is opening. Uh, so probably the people of 11 or 13 in that case might be the optimal. Um, again, there is a lot of uh, interest in this uh, techniques. Um, but again, it might be a little bit challenging um, if you're not an expert or sometimes even acquiring um, the images. So to summarize that long video, uh, I want to summarize a couple of the important points that we talk about. Um, one is our lung is very heterogeneous and it's a very complex problem. Sometimes we try to oversimplify uh, the problem of a very complex problem uh, by, um, for example, by the PEEP FIO2 table. And I know a lot of people would not like that, but that's my personal opinion. Um, again, our lung is heterogeneous, uh, depending on the stage of the disease, the severity of the disease, the nature of the disease. So PEEP should be custom fit for the patient. 
um, not the concept of one hat fits all. Again, I always say we're not cars. Uh, we all take five gallons of oil. Um, but no, even different cars need different uh, amount of oil. Same with peep. There's so many ways. Uh, I can't tell you that there's one certain way or method of setting peep is better than the others. But the more uh, of our understanding improve, uh, I think we'll get uh, a better idea of how to set PEEP. Um, again, thank you for watching. And I hope this was uh, beneficial. Thank you for watching. This video was brought to you by the Society of Mechanical Ventilation.